Pictures from the Psychedelic Swamp Gary Panter, Narrative, and the Politics of Idiosyncrasy I've been thinking a lot lately about art as a solitary experiential practice. That is to say, the process of making the art is the primary, possibly the only, meaning any artwork can claim. In the experience of audiences down through the millennia, however sublime, is just so much collateral testimony to the change in the artist's consciousness during the actual creative process, however fleeting that change may be. Quite apart from the wrench this throws in the machinery of the marketplace and art history, it makes my job as an art critic essentially redundant. But I've known that from the outset. In spite of the amniotic, solipsistic allure of this model, I still occasionally get an inkling of art functioning as some kind of cutting-edge research for human consciousness, like when I consider the work of Gary Panter. I'm pretty certain that the first time I made note of Gary Panter's name, it was his relatively unknown oeuvre of acrylic paintings, rather than his comics or Emmy Award winning sets that made the connection. I had probably seen his LA punk stuff in Slash or Wet and had definitely registered the breathtaking Jimbo work in Raw, but when as a painter in a BFA program in Winnipeg I came across what must have been a photo report on one of his early gallery shows in the pages of Thrasher or High Times. I was already finished with Art Forum. I recognized someone working in the strain of pop semiotics as several of my then and now faves. Keith Haring, David Wojnarowicz, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Sigmar Polk. But Panther had something else going on. Visually, the work appeared as powerful and nuanced as any of these other artists' oeuvres, but the integration of layered pop imagery seemed at once more complex and less forced. At the time, I somehow didn't make the, the connection to Jimbo, and Pee Wee's Playhouse hadn't happened yet. I knew it was probably a better thing art career-wise, to be featured in Art Forum than High Times, but little did I know just how far such cultural chauvinism could go in blindly marginalizing manifestly significant artwork. When I realized this was all the same guy and nobody at art school seemed to have heard of him, I started to get suspicious, and I never stopped. A brief appraisal of Panter's half-tongue-in-cheek 1980 Roz Tox manifesto makes it clear that he was, at the outset of his career, aware of the limitations and contradictions of the art world caste system and its ostensible anti-commercial stance. But this critical awareness has manifested itself through a remarkably positive worldview and a steadfast commitment to realizing alternative ways of situating art in contemporary culture. The point being that one of the most surprising bonuses about Gary Panter is that as an optimistic contrarian, he sheds light, he sheds a light on what's wrong with the art world and Western civilization in general by just doing his thing. His thing was certainly related to whole streams of culture that were already more or less dismissed by the elite. Comics, commercial design, hippies, and punks. At the same time, his work resonated with a whole fine art lineage. H.C. Westerman, Jess, Oivind, Faustrom, Ferro, Eduardo Paolozzi, Peter Saul, Jim Nutt, and the Harry Who, the 
Bay Area funk artists and others. That, at the time, was banished to art, historial, art historical footnote purgatory. <clears throat> As with most genuine cultural eruptions, there had been an epical art world moment identified as pop art, and it was produced by, and inspired, a multiplicity of overlapping voices, but a narrow retroactive set of criteria had been put in place that strictly regulated the border between fancy and regular culture. The fancy people engaged in the antiseptic appropriation of regular stuff recontextualizing it in the highly evolved clinical light of fanciness, thereby reiterating the distinction that had been initially broached. Because if the, regu if the regular can be art, A, how can you charge millions for it, and B, why should anyone bother with the TV? The paradoxical thing is that it's the very irregularity of Panter and his ilk that has excluded them from the canon, while the individuals listed in the above lineage all derive inspiration, more or less, from comics, posters, advertising, and illustration, just like Warhol, Lichtenstein, et al., their common Achilles heel is the issue of containment. They just can't seem to color inside the lines. The difference is epitomized in the different treatment of Bende dots by Lichtenstein and Polk. Roy's precise, ironic, isolationist, and career-long enfoldment into the Greenbergian modernist structuralism versus Sigmar's brief productive fling with monstrous off-register moiré pattern unpredictability before higher powers led him in the next direction, and the next, and the next. Falstrom's paintings always tended toward the interactive, and eventually broke free of the wall in image-based installations. At the same time, his work, like Saul's, refused to toe the innocuousness line of Pop's ambivalent stance toward American global corporate politics. The Harry Who's work, seethed with hyperinflated psychosexual content that distended and filigreed the clean line of comic art into decorative monstrosity. Panter, with his off-register print aesthetics, tangled layers of translated graphic design and refusal to narrow his focus and essentially disown his work in the mass media, fits right in. Apart from these various metaphorical bridlings at the bit, the main containment issue that unites this lineage is one of consciousness. Specifically, the recognition of mass media as the collective unconscious of contemporary human culture and the allowing of archetypal and mythological energy to occupy and validate the liberated imagery. Bestowing on these mutated memes of Dick Tracy, Cowboys and Indians, and Pinup Girls an ongoing symbolic life, rather than the freeze-dried, air-conditioned quarantine of mainstream pop, which, as much as anything, signified putting the lid back on the Pandora's box of modern art, and pasteurizing the pasteurizing and canning of the ab abstract expressionist soup. Let me read that line one more time. The pasteurizing and canning of the abstract expressionist soup. Ads and cartoons are fine as long as they proclaim their meaninglessness up front. Let them start channeling the unconscious passions of mankind, and they are no longer the subjects of discourse. Panter's paintings are exemplary of this deeply playful, potential-laden mode. Even more than with his comics and contribution to Pee Wee's Playhouse, his paintings have the quality of a stage where the clip art players improvise the action, if any. 
often they seem to be just vibrating on the brink of interaction, waiting for the viewer to forge the missing link. This is a characterization that could certainly be applied to many painters, but Panter's work conveys this chock full of critters, symbolic interzone, with a vitality and humor and formal facility equivalent to someone like Paul Clay, the most gifted of the surrealists, except maybe Max Ernst, no slouch at the funny animals or graphic cut and paste himself. Panter's paintings have, in fact, steadily conveyed a greater and greater sense of internal autonomy, beginning in the mid-80s with early overlay works like Benoit Balls, 1985, and reaching a crescendo in recent works like Local Business, 2004, depicting a variety of disconnected entities deployed across a shimmering digital grid of color squares. A pop archetype toolkit, perhaps, reminiscent of Paolozzi's compartmentalized inventories of military hardware or industrial gugas from the late 60s, but where Paolozzi crammed futurist, Paolozzi's crammed futurist frames have a frisson of factory efficiency, Panter's 21st century grids never feel claustrophobic, no matter how busy they get, a reflection perhaps of the approximately infinite digital model of reality that emerged in the interim. The acid probably didn't hurt either. The open window on the personal and collective unconscious aspect of Panter's territory reminds me strongly of R. Crumb's oft-recounted 1965 acid trip, which opened a portal to the world of scampering gurus, jigaboos, and snoids, who subsequently entered consensus reality through his revolutionary underground comics, while Panter's work in the sequential graphic narrative medium seems to emerge from the same transpersonal swamp, his paintings give more of an impression of the view out the portal of a submersible with black light floods picking up the briefly frozen mutant fauna. As a result, the content of those paintings exists in a remarkable state of narrative suspension. One of the most exciting aspects of Panter's comics work is his experimentation with narrative, which is, at various times, fragmentary, recursive, free associative, and postmodernistically referential, just like the drawings. While his mastery over nonlinear narrative has won him recognition, if not fanboy adulation, in the comics world, his parallel accomplishments in the narrative tradition in painting have gone virtually unnoticed. Other prejudices aside, this is probably due to the fact that narrative isn't an issue that Panter addresses with his work, it is the substance of the work, as much as the material that embodies the work's formal elements. This is diametrically opposed to the self-conscious hierarchical remove of the art worlds, capital A, capital W, grudgingly, grudgingly accepted categories of narrative content, theory savvy, austerity, and soft porn. Not to mention narrative as a, wait, sorry, back up. Not to regard narrative as a problem or a means to an end or a big stick is to dis discount the purification from narrative that played such a central role in the history of 20th century art, culminating in minimalism and the subsequent dematerialization of the art object. What is often misunderstood about this art historical arc is that, in retrospect, it makes more sense as a process of distillation rather than elimination. The realization that their grand teleological evaporation of narrative had itself become just another story fuels much of the shame and rage of the academic art theory community. But look at it another way, as a lateral shift 
to a different set of criteria for temporal content, and a window appears. Look at it another way, as a lateral shift to a different set of criteria for temporal content, and a window appears. Abstraction in visual art can be seen as the separation of specifically verbal narrative content to emphasize the sensual narrative content encoded in the formal, in line, color, shape, composition, surface, and scale. The reason such content isn't automatically recognized as narrative is that it depends on a different understanding of time, a time that is simultaneously immediate and cyclic, but linear only in the scraggiest sense. Even at the furthest reaches of monochromic abstraction, there is a programmed temporal experience, a contemplative, slow-mo, phenomenological pulse that I would contend is the stripped-down experimental narrative goal of old-school modernism. As rationalization becomes the lingua franca of Western civilization, the nonverbal language of formalism is understood less and less. But Gary Panter is a master of it. His recent tablecloth color grid grounds, for example, wipe the floor with most of the current crop of Mary Heilmanesque wonky geometric abstractionists. The year 1988 was probably the high point so far of this conspicuous incorporation of high art vocabulary in works like Bonbon, bon, Mini Fishing, and Garden, all of which deploy black line renderings of cartoon figurative imagery and commercial design over bravura abstract grounds that only occasionally correspond with their conventionally readable surface content. For the most part, though, Panter has embedded his painterly chops in the camouflage of commercial printing vernacular. Bright, saturated, off-register colors floating under repeated stock graphic signifiers, including an encyclopedic array of borrowed, mutated, and invented cartoon figures, props, landscape elements, textural patterns, scientific diagrams, text fragments in English, Spanish, Japanese, etc., and occasional events. I locate the narrative singularity of Panther's work largely within this relationship between discrete narrative layers of abstract composition and figurative cartoon scenarios, whose oscillating degree of correspondence is a tertiary narrative system in itself, deriving moiré-like, or third-mind-like, from the superimposition of related but disconnected patterns of information. The story is even further complicated by the fact that Panter's polyglot visual vocabulary also encompasses the semiotic resonance of his pictographic content and of his high art references, many of which are quotations of established stylistic motifs. This semiotic resonance includes all the individual symbolic associations emphasized by the relative absence of sequential contexts in the paintings. Scenes are either lifted whole from a sequential context, as in Rage for Men, 1995, or cobbled together from a variety of narrative tableau that don't quite jibe, Workings, 2003, or entirely isolated entities, landscape elements, and props distributed more or less randomly across a visual field, Plastic Hopes, 2006. We're in a coherent 
encompassing linear narrative, the image of a girl with a machine gun or a dinosaur collapses to its role in the story and its function to propel the forward motion of that story. The same image, stripped of its linearity, shifts its significance to an entire spectrum of more immediately comprehensible, metaphorical, and often verbally unmediated associations. These layers of meaning might simultaneously include personal, social, political, and spiritual mythological content. A robot, for example, might refer to a beloved childhood toy and its role in the development of the artist's capacity for visual fantasy. At the same time, it may trigger similar sense memories in viewers, while also signifying the specific historical, cultural context of the 20th century industrial of 20th century industrial progress and its frightening potential for non-containment. Cold War paranoia, the ironic post-punk appropriation of those meanings, the accumulation of instances when a robot image has been used as a commercial graphic identity, plus a whole ancient can of worms about the uncanny and the Promethean tampering with the creation of life. And the same holds true for every anthropomorphic melon, machete-wielding monster, or funny animal astronaut. Outside of the linear time frame, their range and depth of meaning expand exponentially. So, in addition to the complex relationship between Panter's accomplished paint-for-paint-sake grounds in the experimental narrative fragments, the artist is simultaneously orchestrating an array of dreamlike, iconographic imagery whose immediate symbolic potency is in a constant tug-of-war with its tendency to cluster together into sequential picture stories. I think the heat is just about to come on in the house, so it might get noisy in the background. What is probably most remarkable about this intricate narrative accomplishment is that it seems entirely unforced. Let me start that again. What is probably most remarkable about this intricate narrative accomplishment is that it seems entirely unforced and that it has coincided with equal achievements in graphic narrative and environmental designs ranging from Pee Wee's Playhouse to collaborative psychedelic light shows, as well as notable contributions to online animation and hit merchandising. In trying to detail the complexity and significance of the work, I've taken it as a given that it looks great, but that's certainly a story the work tells on its own. A large part of modernism's animosity toward narrative results from the realization of how addictive it is, how susceptible we are to the most preposterous and destructive fables, and what lengths we'll go to protect them. If we could just eliminate the need to constantly tell ourselves stories, then we'd have a happy ending. Oh, wait. It seems to me that a more practical approach would be to get as good at narrative as possible, to explore it fearlessly so that there are forms to accommodate the different kinds of stories we're going to need to survive the next 50 years. Let me go over that one more time too. It seems to me that a more practical approach would be to get as good at narrative as possible, to explore it fearlessly so that there are forms to accommodate the different kinds of stories we're going to need to survive the next 50 years. Gary Panter is one of a handful of visionary cultural producers working on that front line. Doug Harvey. Doug Harvey is a Los Angeles-based writer and curator who has written extensively about the Los Angeles and international art scenes and other aspects of popular culture primarily as the art critic for LA Weekly and the now defunct Art Issues. His writing has also appeared in 
Art in America, The New York Times, Art Review, and numerous other publications and ex exhibition catalogs internationally.